go make a list of like, what are the five biggest doors that ever opened for you? Make the top five list and then ask yourself, how many of those five things did I meticulously engineer? And how many just sailed in like a puzzle piece falling into my lap? And I didn't even know what to make of them. Humans are terrible at predicting the future. And you know what they're even more terrible at is predicting what's going to make them happy. <laughs> Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody, Nick Nanton here. Uh, I'm excited for a new episode of Now to Next, where I'm bringing on a uh, longtime friend, a guy I've been a fan of for a long time, uh, Mr. Perry Marshall. Let me give you a bit of his bio before we get going so you understand who we're dealing with here. Uh, Perry is one of the most expensive business strategists in the world. He's consulted in over 300 industries. He's endorsed in Forbes and Inc. magazine and has written eight books, including The Ultimate Guide to Google Ads, which is the world's best selling book on internet advertising and his new book memos from the head office which came out in may of this year and shares incredible true stories of entrepreneurs who found success by listening to a power outside themselves another cool thing about perry is in addition to his consulting and speaking work he founded the 10 million dollar evolution 2.0 prize which is the world's largest science research award offered to anyone who can discover the origin of genetics and life on earth perry has a degree in electrical engineering and lives with his family in chicago where he's always working on several projects at any given time perry welcome to the show man it's good to be here thanks for having me it's been a long time it's a it has been an awful long time since we've seen each other, and I'm glad the pandemic has treated you well. Look, at the end of the day, you've got this new book out called Memos from the Head Office. I'd love for you to give a brief synopsis of you know, what the book is about and why you decided to write it. So there are tons and tons of business strategy books and business technique books and finance books and, and everything like that, but there's almost nothing that ever gets said about the fact that some of the very best ideas ever come to people like as a download. And like the best example I can think of is JK Rowling's Harry Potter. She was on a train, it stalled, she had a notebook with her and this idea just started coming and she wrote as fast as she could and she got the basic idea down and then she spent the next few years untangling it and, and straightening it out and you get the best-selling fiction series of all time, and um, and you know I had a I had so to give you a completely different example. I had a guy come to a workshop once. Uh, it was in August of 2013, and uh, we went out to dinner. And he goes, "I had so much fun today. I didn't think about my lawsuit all day long." And I go, "Lawsuit?" And he goes, "Oh." Never mind. I don't want to talk about that. So the next morning, so when I start my day, instead of getting on my cell phone, getting an email, I start my day with a cup of tea and my notebook. And I was just journaling and I was actually praying and I go, what should I talk to everybody about today in the workshop? And the answer I got was ask the guy about his lawsuit and Talk to him about inner healing. Okay, so nine o'clock, we start. I look at my watch, it's 9.20, we did all the housekeeping. Hey, I'm supposed to ask you about your lawsuit. Tell me about your lawsuit. And he goes, ah, oh. well, sexual harassment thing came up two years ago. It's all made up, but it's her word against mine. I didn't do anything, but this has been hanging over my head like a sword of Damocles. And this is just dragging on and lawyer money. And I hope this doesn't go to trial. And, and I said, well, I, I'd like to ask you to do something kind of strange. I go, even though this person is trying to strangle you, 
I would like you to ask God to do good things for this person in her life and that you want to forgive her. And he looks at me and his wife looks at me and they're, they, it's like, they kind of, they get what I'm saying. And they're like, uh, okay. Um, and I talked to him about something else real briefly. And then all of a sudden his phone buzzes in his pocket and I look at my watch and it's 924. So we've been talking about this for four minutes and he goes, he pulls his phone out of his pocket. He goes, my attorney wants me to call him. And I said, it's good news. And his wife goes, it's never good news when that guy calls. I go, take the call. Let's see what happens. And so he leaves the room, comes back 10 minutes later, and he goes, they want to settle. And they're willing to settle for $10,000 less than I decided a couple of weeks ago that I would be willing to settle for. And he wrote a $120,000 check and it was over. And so the question that I would like to ask the listeners is, this thing had been going on for two years. Is it just a coincidence that he forgave the person at 922 and the the text from his lawyer came at 924. Is that a coincidence or did something happen? That's what memos from the head office is about. I love it. At the end of the day, it's about faith, right? And so one time, you know, Joe Sugarman as well, right? Yeah, I do. So Joe, great guy, brilliant guy. I mean, his Batman credit cards, blue blocker sunglasses. He's a brilliant guy. And, and Joe said something to me one time that was a really profound example. He said, and and you you distill it down very similarly in, in your book. He said, the most successful people in the world have one of two things, either amazing faith in an outside force or amazing faith in themselves. The two are not mutually exclusive, by the way, but it's about faith. And I, I believe, you know, I was talking to someone yesterday and someone said, hey, Nick, you've had a lot of success. It's, a, it's a, always a funny question to me, but I, I seem to get it quite often. I think you probably do, too, probably based on our faith backgrounds, one of the reasons. But how do you stay so humble with so much success is the question I get. And I'm like, well. Because I'm just really lucky. I mean, I work hard, but like at the end of the day, how many things in my life are outside of my control? Like I've got to hope no one comes across the double yellow lines. I've got to hope that I don't wake up with a disease tomorrow. I've got to hope, you know, unfortunately I live in Florida. This this condo building just caved in on a bunch of people. It's super sad. I've got to hope that doesn't happen. There are so many things that I do not have control of in my life. Like I'm just going to be thankful for the things I do have control of. I'm going to make every effort I can every day to help as many people as I can. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to work hard. I'm going to try to feed my family. But like at the end of the day, I think it'd be super arrogant to think that I'm in control of all this. And by the way, I would get ulcers if I wanted to try to be in control of all this. So my faith is really the only thing that helps me get through because there's so many times when I do not see a light at the end of that tunnel. I do not see it. And I just got to say, God, you said ask. So I'm going to ask, show me the light. Now, we can talk a lot about this from a faith perspective, which I love. I don't want to lose people, though, who aren't on that journey yet. I, I pray you all get on that journey at some point. So let's talk a little bit about the other side of faith, uh, entrepreneurial faith, as opposed to a, a Christian or a religious faith. Well, I think they're actually a lot more alike than different, right? So, so I know some people would go, oh, well, you know, faith in the laws of physics and religious faith are completely different. Actually, I don't. They're all based on, so we all have to make assumptions, right? So I told that story about the lawsuit. And you. so I think that at the end of the day, everybody has faith in God with a capital G or chance with a capital C, or yeah, I suppose yeah. in some cases, me with a capital M, <laughs> yep. uh, there, there's maybe a couple of those out there. But um, so like you, you asked that question about humility. Um, here's how I think about it. Um, imagine that we, somebody, a gunman came to both of our houses 
and he marches us out in the front yard and he says, I want you to pluck a blade of grass. And so, okay, so we pluck a blade of grass and he says, okay, come back inside. And he says, now look at that blade of grass. You've got like fill in the blank, an hour, a day, a year, a decade, a century. I want you to build something that's as good. That's a, I, I want you to re, recreate this blade of grass. Take your, you know, take your chemicals or go to any biological laboratory in the world or any chemistry. I want you to make grass. Like, dude, one blade of grass is 10,000 years ahead of any human technology. What, what, where I think I get my humility from is nature. Nature is so superior to anything we're doing, right? And we got our landfills and our pollution and all this kind of stuff. Like humans are stupid. If you're comparing yourself to humans, you're making the wrong comparison. I love that. I absolutely love it. It's, it's so this is an interesting discussion too. So a lot of people have this big concern that AI is going to take over the world, artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence is nothing more than that artificial. There are so many, so many, uh, human elements you cannot add to it. I'd love your perspective just as we, we got to here. I wasn't planning on going here. I think AI is going to make humans more human. I believe we're going to take those rote tasks that humans do not need to do, and we're going to get those out of the way with robots. Perhaps, like we're seeing now, uh, it's going to be taking orders at McDonald's. It's going to be doing all sorts of things that, by the way, human beings don't need to be doing. And I think it's going to allow expansion for more humanity. And I believe the highest rewarded people, whether that's with money, significance, like pick the reward. I believe the highest rewards are going to be for the most human interaction. I'd love your perspective on that. So there is no such thing as AI. It's all A and no I. Okay. <laughs> Siri is as dumb as a box of rocks and computers were as dumb as a box of rocks in the 1960s. And the first time my dad showed me a calculator in the 1970s, that thing is d dumb as a box of rocks. And it, like, it's funny you mention this because I published my first scientific paper two months ago. And one of the things that it's, it's got this mathematical proof, and it's, a, it's about, partly about the question of AI. And it's a proof that AI is never going to get I because of the definition of a computer. Now, I'm not gonna get technical on it, but basically what I said was, was I'm the author of books on Google and Facebook. These, they've spent billions of dollars on AI and machine learning. I have thousands of clients who use these platforms and none of these platforms have the slightest hint of consciousness. And Siri is not gonna wake up anytime soon. Now, what I don't say in the paper is, uh, I'll take it a step further. Whenever Elon Musk goes, waxes eloquent about how the machines are going to take over and all that kind of stuff, he is kiting Tesla stock. This is a guy who sells self-driving cars, and he's one of the greatest publicists of all time. All time, right? yes. All right? Now, I think his self-driving cars will eventually make the cut and that that's going to be a thing. Like, I, I think that's going to happen. But if you think that car is actually intelligent, the way a goldfish or a puppy dog or let alone a human, no, no, no way. Um, now, maybe some other kind of computer on some completely different technology that runs on a different principle, that's a whole nother thing. But the computers we have today ain't never going to happen. So Memos from the Head Office is about inspiration as well. And I always find, you know, the more I try to muscle my way through life, the less things happen well. My business partner years ago said I was getting real frustrated things weren't happening fast enough. He goes, Nick, you believe in God, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, if you want to, if you want him to work in your life, you've got to give him elbow room. You cannot control every waking minute of every day. You just got to just lay back and let some things happen. The idea of inspiration and drawing from whether it's your mind, you know, your subconscious could be, uh, it could be channeled through um, from a, a greater power. Talk about, you talked about how you're praying and journaling. You know, I'm, I'm a person who constantly strives to get better at my faith uh, very openly uh, as 
as a Christian, grew up as a kid in, in the church, and then you know found more of a relationship later in my years. I think as most people, as you become more cognizant of life and relationship. But I was the guy who I think I get an A plus for believing th- that the basic tenet of Christianity is if you accept Jesus, you're good. And so I basically was like, I'm good. Like, what else do you want me to do? And so I've, I've in my later years started trying to spend more time, you know, in the Bible. I was super intimidated by the Bible. I still am, by the way, but I'm not that smart. And it took me until like a week ago to realize, well, there's never going to be any more of it. So don't worry. Don't freak out about it. Like, it's like, it's thick, but they're not writing anymore. So you don't you just focus on what's here. And so it's like a big revelation that I didn't have to get overwhelmed. It wasn't going to be like the next series of Game of Thrones where there's like eight more seasons coming. It's like, no, this is the thing. And maybe just work on the New Testament first. And But it's really hard to figure out where to begin in this journey. So, and again, I'd love to speak. I'd like to add faith in there. So to encourage anybody else who's on that journey too, but even if you're not a a, a Christian or, or, or religious person, I hate the word religion because it's a different deal, but a relationship with a higher power, if you're not that kind of person, where do you begin Perry to, to try to start either one of those people to try to start gaining that inspiration, to try to start hearing what you should be hearing instead of the noise. So here's an exercise that I think anybody can do. So let's say you you don't you know zero about the Bible, like you you don't know nothing. Okay, try this. Go on Google, type in list of Bible stories, and click on a website that's got like a list of Bible stories, and it tells you like you know Luke 14 or Joshua 12 or right. So and then go go to one of the Bible sites and pull up that chapter and just read it, okay? So it's the story of David and Goliath, or it's the story of Adam and Eve, or it's the story of healing the man or whatever. Read a story and do this. Take your notebook. As soon as you're done reading the story, write, okay, God, or okay, higher power, or okay, whatever you want to call it. Tell me about me or tell me about David, like whatever you want to say, ask the question. And then whatever comes, you write it. You do not edit. You do not question. You do not compose. It's like if you, if, if you suddenly start thinking about a white feather, then you write down white feather and you just go and you will be surprised at what flows out and when you get done you can decide whether that was you or a bad burrito or the head office but the important part is that you got it out and that you wrote it down and that you asked the question without editing And anybody can do that. And I actually, I think God is way closer to people than they think. I think most people have heard from God numerous times. Can I I tell you a little story about 20, 25 years ago? I was in Chicago. It was a snowy afternoon. I was in Amway at the time. Okay. I was like doing the pink Kool-Aid MLM thing. All right. And I had an appointment with a guy in Indianapolis, which is three hours away. And a couple of times during the afternoon, I got this little, why don't you call the guy and make sure you confirm the appointment? And I ignored it. So I drive down to Indianapolis three hours and I get to the restaurant and he's not there, and I call him on the payphone. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm packing for a trip tomorrow. It's leaving really early. There's no way he can come. I'm so sorry. Can we reschedule? And now I got to turn around and go home, except I get a flat tire. Okay. And then I can't drive three hours home on a spare, and it starts snowing. So I, I, I find one truck stop that's open. And I drive down there to South Indianapolis and I get my tire change with money I don't have. Okay. And then I drive home. It probably took me four or five hours to get home because it was a blizzard and there's semis all over the place and cars in the median. And, and it's like, it's, it's so, it's snowing so hard that if you go more than 35 miles an hour, your, your, your windshield is going to cover up with snow and ice. 
And I, I probably got home at like four in the morning. Okay. I believe that Perry, you, you should call first. I think that was a memo from the head office and I ignored it. I, I was talking to the guy that designed my book cover. I was trying to explain this idea and he goes, I said, how about, have you heard those stories of people that like they had this funny feeling and they didn't go to work on 9-11? And he goes, oh, I know one of those people. She always went to work. She never missed a day. For some reason, she had this funny feeling and she didn't go in. And he's like, I go, that's a memo from the head office. And he's like, oh, okay. It's like, I think people are getting these things a lot and they don't even know. I think atheists get these things. Fascinating. One of the things that you talk about there is uh, there, there's a lot of depth there could be in in that idea, um, but a lot of people think if I find faith, bad things should stop happening, and we know that this is not the case in life. So how do you how do you reconcile those things? I have these friends whose. 10 week old baby died of sudden infant infant death syndrome a few years ago. And man, like, it, okay, it's one thing when Uncle Carl dies, it's a whole nother thing when a 10 month old baby. Oh my goodness. So I go to this funeral and the husband comes up to me during the dinner and he goes, you know, Perry, you got to come over sometime. He, like the husband struggles with faith less than his wife does. And I went over to their house one night. He said, just show up unannounced. That's like probably the best way. So one, one evening, I, took, I, I brought a bottle of wine and I knocked on the door and they were home. Okay, so like they lost their baby two months ago. And we're, and we're talking about this question. And I said... I said, well, um, you know, in the New Testament, you've got a story of Peter was in prison and an angel came and let him out. And you got another story. John the Baptist is in prison and the, the, this girl wants his head on a platter and the king gives it to him. And I said, I don't know why Peter got out and why John lost his head. What I know is this story is honest about both of them. And I, I think there, there is nothing worse than dishonest art or dishonest religion or dishonest silent science for that matter, that tries to tell you a story that people want to hear that isn't the way the world is. If when I, like, what does it say about, he was a man, Jesus was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. I don't see any sugarcoating of anything in the actual story. I see a lot of TV evangelists sugarcoating things. Right. Yep. There's there's plenty of that. One of your first memos from the head office, or it seems, was about this 80-20 <laughs> rule that you you sort of everyone talks about the 80-20 principle. Everyone's probably heard it in in many aspects. What's the basic example you give, but then you also decide to dig deeper? Tell us that journey a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So um, I thought I understood 80-20 when I was a sales manager at a software company. And, and I read this book and it said, guess what? 20% of your customers produce 80% of your sales. I was like, is that right? That doesn't sound right. And I printed out a QuickBooks report. Sure enough, I'm like, I'll be darn. And then I, and then I didn't really understood what I had just learned. And I just went back to doing normal things. Well, a few years later, I read Richard Koch's 80-20 book, and I got to page 14, and he makes this offhand comment that uh, the 80-20 has a lot to do with chaos theory. And I was like, whoa! Well, I knew what that meant. What it meant was, there. therefore, there's an 80-20 inside every 80-20, and another one, and another one. So, so... 
20% of your customers, 80%. 20% of the 20% produce 80% of the 80%. And then it goes on again and again and again. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is like my, my head set on fire. Wait a minute. That means like this is like a calculus formula. It applies to everything. It applies to traffic on the roads and spreadsheets and Facebook accounts, like and craters on the moon. So what is the formula? So I started, I'm an engineer. I have an electrical engineering degree. I'm a propeller head. I'm a geek, like total, totally. Um, and I started working on this and I got stuck. So it's this one day. It's March 2003. It's a Friday, just like today, actually. And I'm like trying to figure out this formula. And I'm stuck. I, it's not working. I, I, I can't make it work. And I was obsessing about something else. So, Nick, you'll totally relate to this. Nick, have you ever had, especially early on, like, like when you're a young entrepreneur and you're just scrapping and stuff, did you ever have that caveman discovers fire moment where something you did suddenly works? Yes. Okay. I had one of those moments three days before this day that I'm telling you about. And so I was obsessing about what is this math formula? And hey, I just, caveman just discovered fire. How could I help my brother-in-law's project in Mozambique, which is the 18th poorest country, and they have a school, a church, a feeding program, an AIDS hospice, all this stuff. And so I was thinking about math in Mozambique all day long. So there's this music thing at church and I go to the music thing at church and they're just playing this Pink Floyd kind of music. And I'm in la la land and I'm thinking about calculus and I'm thinking about Mozambique and I look up and there's this woman making a beeline for me and she sticks out her hand and she says, hi, my name is Vivian and the Lord gave me a word for you. Now I'm like, what? I've heard of this. I've never seen it happen. The churches I ever went to, they didn't have any of that. So I guess this should be interesting. She goes, the Lord told me that you're very good at math and you're working some kind of formula, some kind of equation, some kind of invention, and you are going to figure it out. But you have to keep working. Just keep working at it. You figure it out. And I looked at her and I looked around. There's probably 30 people in the room. And I thought. What are the chances that anybody's working on a math problem right now? And what are the chances that she got me right the first time? Like, that's crazy. And she turns to walk away and then she spins around and she goes, oh, and he told me something else. You want to support missions and God is going to bless your business so you can support missions. Okay. Now my jaw is on the floor. She nailed me twice. And I just stared at her. And I was almost in tears. And I go, if only you knew. And she goes, he knows. And just walked away. And I stood there. I was like, did that just happen? How did that happen? This has never happened to me. I do not have random strangers walking up to me telling like reading me my mail and i thought about it I was like dang well so what happened next well so fast forward a couple years my business has grown four or five x it's gone from making a an okay living to making a very comfortable living I'm getting invited to speak at seminars all over the world about Google ads. I look back in my calendar and I find out that three days before I met Vivian, I got an email from Ken McCarthy saying, I think you should speak at my seminar on Google ads. And I accepted the invitation. And back then you have to remember, in 2003, Google was not the king of the internet. Google was this weird search engine with a white, all white and, and, and no cell phone ads, okay? And, um, and, and so, so 
three days before I met Vivian, like this huge door opened and then Google becomes the king of the internet and I end up writing the best selling book on Google advertising. Um, and, 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 and she told me to keep working on this 80, 20 formula. And I did. And three, three years later, I actually figured it out and it became the basis of my 80, 20 book. It got published in Harvard business review in 2018 and you can use it to, for it's incredibly useful. Like I sold a thousand five dollar lattes at, at my coffee shop. How many $22,000 espresso machines am I going to sell? And that, that formula will tell you. And so, and so my entire career, as I know it, started with a one minute conversation in 2003 with a black woman that I'd never seen before who told me the, the Lord has a word for you. Okay. So I, I've had that, you know, it's kind of like the JK Rowling experience. And for that matter, reading Richard's book and making that flash of connection, like, wait a minute. Like I, I had like, I know what this is. I've seen this before. Like, I think that was a memo from the head office too. And so like these things are available to people. And like when, one time I was, I was doing a seminar and a guy had read this story in a book and he came up to me and he started tearing up. He goes, Perry, I grew up with faith and then I got older and I got cynical and I didn't believe it anymore. He goes, when I read that story, I knew oh my goodness, this is for real. And he goes, I've come back. And he goes, thank you for bringing me back. Wow, that's a that's a great uh, moment, great testimony. One thing you talk about in the book is that, you know, in order to have great faith, the greatest way is you actually have to become childlike again. And that's a really, I think as an entrepreneur, that's a, a secret too. I think it's a secret to most things in life because most of our behaviors are learned, our patterns are what got us to where we are. Of course, every every sword cuts both ways. So you've worked towards amazing strengths, but they've opened up these amazing gaps as well. Uh, what do you what do you mean when you say to be more childlike, and how do you do that? So you really described it really well earlier about like not trying to micromanage everything. So I, I actually have an exercise for everybody. Th this is one of the most useful things you could do. Um, go make a list of like, what are the five biggest doors that ever opened for you? It could be your marriage. It could be your career. It could be your company. It could be your, you know, your PhD thesis for all, like, like, whatever, okay? Make the top five list and then ask yourself, or maybe it was a career change, right? Like, you were a mortgage broker and then suddenly you decided to be a fitness coach or, like, whatever. Ask yourself, how many of those five things did I meticulously engineer? And how many just sailed in like a puzzle piece falling into my lap? And I didn't even know what to make of them. And then I took that road. Like, so humans are terrible at predicting the future. And you know what they're even more terrible at is predicting what's going to make them happy. <laughs> yep. And, and so, boy, you know, when you can just like, look, even if I thought I knew like how to engineer the future, I would still be a fool to try. And I'm not saying be passive. I work hard at all kinds of things, but still, most of the good things that happen are not my doing. That's I, I feel the same way. And I also feel like, you know, there's two types of people in the world. And I find that anyone who truly finds significance. Um, one thing that I work with is I work with celebrity experts and it's an interesting term because the term celebrity turns a lot of people off, but so like celebrity on its own, we could make many examples of that is, is just being recognized, being, being famous for whatever reason An expert. There's plenty of experts that no one knows who they are in the basements of universities. They're in back rooms at tech companies or whatever. I love working with celebrity experts because celebrity experts are people who are so good at what they do, the world can't ignore it, right? And 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 you are in that category, many of my network is. And I love people like that because 
there's a value in what they bring rather than, uh, I don't know, vapid insecurity, basically. But, you know, there's two types of people I find when the people who become celebrity experts, the people who seek significance and impact in the world, they do something different than everybody else. And it's funny because my exercise is similar to yours. And there's the, the two types of people are people who write off their backstory as just like, oh, it's no big deal. Just it just was my life. And, and I find that nine, we'll say 80, 20, we'll say 80% of the world does that, right? The 20% who find true, usually happiness, um, true impact, true significance are those who are willing to process their story and realize the moments that led them to where they are right now. So the exercise I make people do is divide your life up into most people would say it's probably three or four big, uh, tranches. So like phase one is adolescence, like whatever you can remember till maybe grade school. Then you've probably got like high school and college. You've got early career marriage, maybe child rearing. And then there's, there's this other stage I'm not aware of yet that allegedly exists when the kids are out of the house, which I'm not pushing them, but it allegedly exists. And so if you just take those, those, however you want to divide that up, the thing, and it doesn't matter how you divide it up. It's whatever your brain tells you, these are divisions of my life. And you write down the like five or 10 of the most significant positive and negative experiences that you had. And you write them all down again, no editing. It's a great, I love your rule. No editing. It's like, let's do that later. Don't let the, let the brain do what the brain does and let, we'll figure it out later. And so when you go back and look at that, like I have a moment, I must've talked about it 20 times down the last two years that I really gave no significance to publicly, but I think drove me very much privately. I had a third grade teacher tell me I was stupid, right? And it just bugged the crap out of me. Yeah. And I think I've spent most of my adult life trying to prove this woman wrong. And by the way, you know, I don't, I know she doesn't remember that moment. She asked my mom every time she sees her in the grocery store, Oh, how's Nick doing? He's one of my favorites. You know, it's just, she just had a bad day, but like we, but these moments, if we don't stop and process them, we cannot change we cannot change our past, but we can change the way we process it. And I, I'm a big Tony Robbins guy. I got a great offline story for you about Tony and Faith, by the way. Um, but uh, you know, life happens for you, not to you, right? And I believe when you take those moments that your brain marks as significant, you look at what you're doing today, not only your vocation, but the way you deliver what you deliver – it tells you it's truly like a roadmap of secrets. And uh, most people just never take that time to do that. And I love the fact that most of those moments were not of your own volition. They just happened. Some did. Sometimes you made a really bad decision to drink and drive or you took drugs or you whatever. Right. I mean, we all make bad decisions like that's that's OK. But I, I'm, I think people be very shocked. I love the way you put that. I've never had them look at how many of those things do they feel fully 100 percent responsible for. And I bet it's very few. I believe that when you look at your life as being part of a larger story that is being woven together rather than just billiard balls banging around in the universe, it gives you a lot more freedom to make connections that most other people wouldn't connect. And it doesn't mean that all your connections are going to be right. Sometimes the, they won't, they'll be blind alleys, but I think it's much more fun to live your life with the expectation that there's some kind of a plan and a purpose going on. In fact, I think people that don't have that are usually a little bit sad and a little bit despondent uh, when you chip below the surface. Uh, well, it's it's hard. <laughs> it's super hard not to be cynical in general. And if you don't believe that there's someone, something like looking out for you. And I do believe there's, I mean, I, I'm an optimist. So, but there's, I, there's a, probably because of my faith, there's a silver line in every cloud. Like I learn, I learn from failure. And, and I always tell people, you know, again, I'm not that smart, but I just realized the other day, like everything's going to work out because it has to, there's no other option. It's just going to work out. And when time is done, it's just done. And so, you know, on here on earth, as, as we'd say, now I'm really interested too in your evolution 2.0, breaking the deadlock between Darwin and design. This strikes me just as a complete challenge to anybody who says, 
that can't be true. There's a big bang. There's a, which by the way, all requires faith because no one can say where the elements came from. So tell me about this and where it's led you over the last few years you've been, you've been offering the challenge. So this started 17 years ago. My, I'm a pastor's kid and my brother uh, went to seminary, moved to China and became a missionary. And so I went to go visit him and I discovered when I arrived there, he had thrown Christianity out the window. Like, I don't believe this stuff anymore. And I knew he was having some struggles, but like, I, wow, like this was really jarring. And we got into an argument and I go, Brian, look at the hand at the end of your arm. This is a nice piece of engineering and I'm an engineer. So you don't think this is an accumulation of random accidents, do you? And he goes, hold on. And he just came right back at me with this whole thing about it. It was basically a traditional old school Darwinian evolution. You don't need any designer. You just need enough time. And I thought, wow, they really got him um, <laughs> for one thing. <laughs> um, and I thought, OK. I'm not sure if I buy that. Maybe I maybe, maybe not. But I know a lot of biologists would totally agree with them. So what do they know that I don't? Because I never learned anything in engineering school that would match up to this explanation that Brian gave me. Well, we're sitting there arguing and I decided, you know what? Arguing with Brian is not very productive. It's ruining your little vacation. You're just gonna have to set this elephant in the room aside and try to spend some time with your brother. But Perry, when you go back home, you got to figure this out because I can't ignore a good question. And so I was like, okay, what do the biologists know that I don't? Well, 17 years later, I am still going down the rabbit hole. And what I found out was, it's not really what the biologists know, it's, the cells in our own body know a bunch of stuff that none of us know. And this became so fascinating. And if you wanted to reduce my book to two sentences, it's Darwinists underestimate nature and creationists underestimate God. In other words, they're both right in a certain sense and they're both missing half the picture. Now, I'm not, I'm not gonna go too much more into that. If, you, if, if I raise your curiosity, order Evolution 2.0, it's on Amazon. But what I realized was there's a bunch of questions we don't know the answers to. And most people just default to the, like, the left or the right, the, ans the canned answer that they're given. And I don't think the can answers on either side are very good. And, and I said, we have to honor science, experimental actual science, and not just argue about angels dancing on the head of a pen. And so I founded the world's largest science research prize. And it's called the Evolution 2.0 Prize. And the question it's trying to answer is, where did the genetic code come from? Where does any code come from? Where does information come from? Because you have to solve that problem in order to explain that where life came from. And so I have the leading geneticist at Harvard Medical School, George Church. I have the leading physiologist at Oxford. Um, I announced the prize at the Royal Society in Great Britain, which is the oldest scientific organization in the world. And we're really serious about this. And I've got very, very talented scientists that are working on solving the problem. And I think this is one of the most profound mysteries in all of science. And, and, and it's, it's very exciting. And I don't know where it's going. Like, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if this is solvable. I don't know what we're getting. What I know is there's nothing more powerful than a great question. I, I, I love that. Uh, there's no the only good answers are the answers we come to from great questions. So it all starts with the question. We do know the question comes before the answer. And so the chicken or the egg thing is not here. Uh, Perry, also in the book, 
I mean, you talk about uh, how to get more memos from that office. You talk about needing to recharge as an entrepreneur and as a parent. You talk about the question of does God want you to be successful? You cover an awful lot in this book in memos from the head office. Obviously, everyone needs to go out, check out a copy of it. Perry, if they want to engage more, want to hear more about your thoughts, your everything you're thinking about, what you're working on, where can they find more of you once they get the book? If, if you like the evolution stuff, I've got a podcast, so you can subscribe to the Evolution 2.0 podcast. And if you like the faith aspect of, or, or, or you're curious, you know, maybe you're an agnostic or Jewish or Catholic or whatever, Memos from the Head Office, it's on Amazon, it's about 11 bucks. And it it's, uh, every story in the book is documented. There, It's not a bunch of anonymous feel-good stories. It's like, Names, dates, places, locations, careers, websites, all of that. I, I don't I don't like these anonymous kind of miracle stories. I, I think people need to be upfront about who they are and, and, and what's going on. So um, I really think it, it, it'll probably change the way you see the whole world. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining me here. And I'll see you all next time on Now to Next with Nick Nanton. Take care. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching.